So I have great pleasure this morning to be with uh, Julia Samuel, MBE, who is psychotherapist, uh, author and founder patron of Child Bereavement UK. So firstly, a big thank you, Julia, for seeing us this morning uh, to discuss all things bereavement awareness, uh, grief and loss. I'm delighted to be with you, John. Thank you for inviting me. No, thank you. Before we go into certain areas such as uh, bereavement awareness in schools, which obviously you, we've, we've spoken about before, uh, I'd like to cover a few, of, a few of your areas and your work that you've done, and in particular, some of the books that you've done as well. Firstly, uh, in your book, Grief Works, um, you share stories of people who have experienced different types of loss. What drew you to writing about grief and what have you learned from your work with grieving individuals? I mean, I've learned so much and I'm still learning. And I wrote the book because I, you know, I'd worked in the NHS for 25 years and with Child Bereavement UK for decades. And so I did have a lot of experience and knowledge. But what I found was that when clients walk through my door, they still kind of felt they were grieving wrong. They didn't have an understanding of what grieving was like, and they kind of felt that they were failing, that they weren't moving forward or getting over it. And I think real stories, so those are real case studies of a partner dying, a parent dying, a child dying, a sibling dying, and facing your own death. Those real stories, I think, are the most personal, is the most universal. So although they may not recognize some aspects of it, the experience that I was describing of the kind of roller coaster of grief, how it can make you feel like you're going mad, how it changes your relationship with yourself and your external world, and what matters in supporting you is the love and connection to others. And yet your relationships are often destabilized by the grief did seem an important message to get out in the world so that people could understand themselves better and find ways of really allowing themselves both to grieve and feel the pain of loss. And unfortunately, pain is the agent of change, so it's finding a way of allowing the pain to come through them and also finding a way of letting themselves live, love, trust life, and live in the life that they have and the kind of movement between the two. Um, and I think that's, a, you know, a really important message. And do you think that reinforces the message that grief and the emotions we go through is always unique? So I think some people think they might be grieving incorrectly, as you mentioned, and I'm not feeling this today or I laugh today, so is that bad? Do we need to do more work to sort of reinforce that it's always going to be unique? I think we are as different on the inside as we look on the outside. So of course, there's our own particular unique experience, which is informed by our relationship with the person that died, our own history, our psychological makeup, the circumstances of the death, and the support that we get. I do also think there are universal norms about grief that we is useful to kind of understand and allow. So I think it's sort of both. Yeah, okay, thank you. So you've talked about the eight pillars of strength and um, one of those being exercise. How do you think that plays a part in how we, we heal with our, with our grieving and loss? I think, I mean, there's many aspects to this. I think, first of all, that um, physical strength does give us a capacity for mental strength that allows us to weather the pain of loss. Also, grief often feels like fear, sometimes terror, and it, our whole system goes on hyper alert, particularly at the beginning, but if it's a traumatic death, for a long time. And the thing about exercise is, is that it circuit breaks your kind of hyper arousal. So you, your cortisol levels lessen. You have more oxytocin, more capacity to connect and you feel calmer. And the thing that we need when someone dies and the thing that is most difficult. So when we're kind of traumatized, it is very difficult to feel love and connect lovingly 
but when we are connected with ourselves, we can then give and receive love. And that is how we manage and metabolize the pain of the loss and how those waves come and get you. And do you think that also ties into just general mental health as well, how we improve mental health uh, with more, more exercise? A hundred percent. I mean, there's no question that regular exercise is the equivalent. I mean, so the NICE guidelines, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, shows that regular exercise is the equivalent to a low dose of antidepressants. So whoever I'm seeing, I will always say to them, get outside, move your body. However much pain you're in, you will always feel better when you come back inside. No, that's great advice. And um, yeah, I totally agree as well. If you're feeling down, going for a run or... Or a walk. A walk. walk around the block. Yeah, just fresh air and sunlight it can be so helpful. It so really helpful. does. Yeah. So moving forward then, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought loss and grief to the forefront of many people's lives. We saw it daily, uh, numbers on a screen. What advice would you give to someone who is struggling to cope with the grief of losing a loved one during that time of the pandemic? I mean, I think there were many complexities um, for those that were bereaved during the pandemic. Often, they weren't by the bedside for the death if the, if the person they loved was in a care home or in a hospital. And so they didn't have the opportunity to have a proper goodbye. And I think psychologically, that's like having a sort of half finished sentence that you want to go back and finish. So it, that can feel very, very um, complicated and disturbing. And it's like a piece of the puzzle that you keep wanting to put the piece in. Um, on the other side of it also, People couldn't go to the graveside at the maximum. I mean, you'd know much more about this so, than me. Some, sometimes it was six people maximum, and it went to 10. Obviously, it was changing as well, so it was very difficult. And, you know, funerals and rituals are incredibly important because they are the external symbol of what by then is invisible that the person has died. And also, they mark a huge psychological piece of the reality of my significant person is no longer present in my physical life. And if you don't have that and you haven't got the support of the people around you, then your, your capacity to grieve untrammeled is much more complex. I think the other aspect of it was the isolation, you know, I will keep saying in different ways, what we need is love and connection and support of others. There were a lot of widows who their children, adult children, couldn't even come home when their parents had died. So they were in their home alone, isolating, not able to see their partner when they died. Maybe they died on a screen in a hospital. Yeah, no connection. No connection. So to answer the second part of your question of how might they manage, I think sometimes they need to develop a ritual that will in some way represent what they couldn't do at the time. So it may be that they mark the death in a significant way with family members. It may be a memorial service, but it could also be kind of in a place that you all agree that you, you, know, you, you stand around and every person says a prayer or a poem or talks about the person that died and they mark it so that you you have an ending. Yeah. Not that you get over from an ending, because obviously grief isn't something you get over, but you finish that sentence and you may be... The other thing I've recommended to quite a few clients is to write to the person that died. So if you didn't have the opportunity to say your goodbye, is to write them a letter, sometimes postcards, yeah. because, you know, as you will know, and all of the people watching this will know, that the person is no longer physically present, but the relationship with them and the love for that person never dies. And so finding an external touchstone for that love, to that love by writing letters, is a way of expressing what they couldn't express in person. And, and connecting. And connecting. So I speak um, a lot about the rise now in the United Kingdom of an unattended direct cremation. And it concerns me because even though I think there is a, there is a need in the UK for it, it, it suits some people, um, I have concerns that people who opt for this choice 
Um, I have concerns of where they'll be in five years' time with their grief and, and, their, and their loss. And I think it highlights the purpose of what we have a funeral service for. It's about providing the platform uh, to say goodbye. From, and from to honour the memory and to face their own mortality while they're recognising that the person they love has died. And we have had the ritual of funerals or a significant ritual since time began. There's a, a Doinoit stone, which is 2000 BC, which is a funeral stone. So it's, you know, stones and marking and coming together, gathering together to remember, to honor, to celebrate, to cry together, to be sad and to have the memory of that yeah. in their being that when they kind of have a, a moment, they know in a way they can't not know that this person has died because the task of mourning is to face the reality of the loss. And so what you're talking about is that you worry for them for the future is that if you haven't done anything that lets your mind and body know, which is a single unit that works together, your brain is a learning machine. It needs the information to know that this thing has happened. Because otherwise, we're born to believe that people live. So, you know, we have secure attachment. My husband has just left. I have to believe that I'm going to see him in four hours' time, because otherwise I would go mad every time he walked out the door. So my brain believes that he's going to be okay. And the task of mourning when he dies, or if he dies, not I mean he will die, but <laughs> if I'm alive when he yeah, dies, no, just to you. get super complicated, is to let myself know that he has died, that he's not coming back. Yeah, yeah, processing, acceptance, yeah. It is, it is acceptance, but it is also knowledge. It's that your wiring knows it, and it takes a long time, but it takes external factors to let ourselves know, because otherwise we live in magical thinking. So in the days that I worked at St. Mary's, and maybe this isn't right for you, but sometimes um, when mothers had a stillbirth, their partners would want them to be anaesthetized and have a cesarean, not have labor, because they felt that it would protect them. Yeah. But they would then go home with no memory of seeing the baby, of giving birth to the baby. So they went to the hospital pregnant. Wow. And then there'd be this gap. And it's that gap that is crazy making, because somewhere in your system, you know something awful has happened, mm. but you don't have the data, the narrative, the story that fits with this awful feeling that, that matches. Yep. And so I think having unattended cremations, and I'm sure there are good reasons which I don't fully understand. But they would, I would imagine that those families would need to do their version of it that marked the death. Yes, yeah, I think that, that is happening um, in different ways, but I, th I think it's still that physical connection like we've discussed. So, can I, can I say something else, which I don't yeah. know that, I mean, I am 63, so I am probably out of date. But I, I disagree with that. <laughs> yeah. But I also think this idea of protecting yourself from the truth often sets up real problems for yourself and that we can't protect ourselves. Life is difficult, life is painful, bad things happen. And when I see at funerals that it's a celebration of the life, that everyone comes in lots of colours we're going to laugh, we're going to um, dance, and there isn't actual any mourning, there's a part of me that worries. That's interesting. Because I'm kind of thinking, OK, we don't need to wear black, although I prefer to wear black because I like putting on the external garments that represent what I'm doing psychologically, and that kind of works for me. Um, but I can see that a younger generation, you know, wearing the person's favourite colour, wearing their football stripe. But if you're only celebrating, you're not allowing yourself to feel the pain. Yeah, yeah. And that it's bothers me. It's important. So 
I believe in, in when I look after a family who are grieving and are bereaved, in how I can give them options to empower them. And that empowerment is about, like you say, understanding what's going on. And I believe taking responsibility and being part of certain aspects from someone dying until the day of the funeral can be really helpful as well. So things such as families helping prepare and dress their loved ones. Yeah, that really helps. Um, a lady recently, uh, her, her young son took his own life and um, we changed the, 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 the mortuary layout so it was less clinical looking and candles and music and she put on his socks and said I was the first person to put his socks on and now I'm the last. Yeah. And there's something very powerful about that. Um, and even down to closing the coffin. I always feel like it's an honour which I don't deserve. Yeah. Um, so I, I wanted to let people know that they can be involved in that as well. I'm aware for some people they think, well, no, I don't want to be involved in that. But I think it's important they know they can be. I mean, I completely agree with you. I think that's an incredibly moving story. And actually, I remember a mum saying to me um, that I wanted to put my son's socks on because I was worried that his feet would be cold, yeah. reminding us all that although the person has died, they feel alive in you. Mm. And that when we don't give them the choices to have those opportunities to do those things of dressing them, being with them, closing the coffin, they may regret it. Yeah. So the big thing I say to clients is the time between the death and the funeral is a finite time. And in it, you have to make decisions change your mind, get the information, gather together and make the best decision that you can, knowing that you've made the best decision you can, given who you are and what's happened, because you can never go back and put this right. Mm. And often there's this haste, which I think now because of there's a delay often with funerals, but yes. often in earlier times, um, there was a haste to get the funeral done because there was this hope that once I've got it out of the way, then I can get on with my life. Yeah. And that isn't the case. Yeah. So I do think that vital time of, you know, making sure that you've really thought about the music, the coffin, what they're wearing, had the opportunity for children to come and say goodbye, for people to put mementos in the coffin, to write letters to go in the coffin, all of that will stay with them for the rest of their life. Yes. And if they don't do it, it will haunt them for the rest of their life. Yeah. Um, and so it sounds like you do it in a very kind of loving, tender way that gives them the chances of having agency. They didn't have choice over the person dying. They didn't have power. Yeah. But they do have power. And control. Make, and control in making yeah. this the best funeral they can. What I would encourage your funeral directors is for those that want to be absent is to say, I completely respect your opportunity that you don't want to be present. And I would also think, will you, when, will you look back at this in five years time and will you be happy with that decision? Yeah. So just hold both so that they can think about that rather than just going along with it. Again, what, what I'm seeing and hearing is people are opting for an unattended direct cremation uh, because a lot of the time, uh, the person who has died has been the one who's opted for it. So the family are fulfilling the wishes of the person that's died. So do you think we need to do more work at national level to highlight who the funeral service is actually for? Well, I think, I mean, I think that's a really interesting question. I think it is for both. Yes. It is for the person that's died and the more conversations that families can have before we die. I mean, I think we often may even recognize our own death and that we're mortal, although I think we have a kind of magical thinking that it's going to happen to other people. But I think while we've been untouched by very significant loss, we sort of think I'm never going to be bereaved. That definitely happens to other people. And so I would encourage all families, when everyone's really healthy, well before they're likely to die, to have those conversations. And in some way, I would like society to know that an unattended cremation 
um, doesn't give the family the opportunity to have a ritual and a memory which will support them through their grieving process afterward. Thank you, Julia. Um, so it's my goal <coughs> to help society have uncomfortable conversations, so as we've already mentioned, around death and grieving. Um, and I'd like to have the conversations before the event. And I see that as being having it in schools um, will help have the conversations in a safe environment with, with safe lessons which are already in place. Um, and that will help people who suffer a loss. So every 22 minutes in the UK, a parent will die. That's not including aunties, uncles, siblings, grandparents, even pets. Um, and it will help the children in the classroom have some compassion and empathy. We'll try and build on that, support the teachers, and then from a wider society point of view. What's your view on, on that? I'm wholly with you. So, I mean, we both know that 80% of anyone under 18 has been significantly bereaved. And so the more we can prepare people, children and young people, that death is part of life, that it isn't this terrible thing that suddenly crashes in and blows your whole life up, which it can feel like. Because I, I think two things. I think in one way you can never be prepared for someone to die because when it happens, even if we know it's going to happen three hours before or three months before, that moment of death you can in some way never be prepared for. But I think if we have a kind of basic understanding and belief that we are all going to die, people that we love and ourselves, we have a, an openness to the experience when it happens to us. It doesn't break some kind of fixed belief that I'm going to be safe from this. And in having that openness allows us to have the emotional resilience and endurance to weather the pain of it. And, you know, it's the things that we do to block the pain that do us harm over time. And I think ignorance is a big blocker of what, what we do to not allow the pain. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree. And what would your advice be to those um, people that might say, will, will this not put children through unnecessary sadness, learning about things um, which they may not have, have done previously, even though it's, on, it's in their films and Disney films? What advice would you give them? The children, um, I completely understand that all parents want to protect their children and they want their children to be happy. I get that. I also want them to recognise and funeral directors to recognise and schools and teachers to recognise that life is both happy and we can have wonderful things and life is difficult and we can have very difficult painful things including death. And so if we have that as, as our kind of map of ourselves and the world, we have much more capacity to manage it because we kind of get that death happens. Otherwise, we're kind of thrown onto this completely alien planet for which we have no map, we have no steering wheel or direction, and we feel completely lost. And so, you know, I don't think we can protect children from the truth. I think we, when we overprotect them, they then feel excluded and they may shut down and everyone may say about them, they're amazing, they're getting on, they bounce back, children are extraordinary. But I certainly see coming through my door many, many children who are bereaved, I mean, and many adults who are bereaved as children who are now dealing with the aftermath and yeah. the legacy of what wasn't dealt with at the time. Yeah, and I think it reinforces the message that building young people is surely a better, better method than trying to uh, help and fix adults that are in a real tough time, a real, a real tough place. I think that reinforces the point really, that's, they are the future. An early intervention makes a huge difference. Yeah. So you can predict the mental health of a 14-year-old, of what their future mental health is going to be like. Wow. Um, 
And the other stat, it is an old one, but another stat is that 15% of all psychological disorders come from unresolved grief. Yeah. So, you know, this is no small matter. We are all going to be bereaved. So having a way of knowing how to support ourselves, how to talk about it honestly with each other. I mean, I think the big thing with children is telling them the truth, that everybody in the family has the same truth, and so that they can face that together. Because what children don't know, they make up. Yeah. And what they make up is much worse than the truth and much more frightening and it's limitless and often in it they blame themselves like it's because I was naughty it's because I didn't do this it was because I hated so-and-so or I was cross or and that is really damaging yeah thank you Judy that's really interesting you mentioned about um, trying to help adults who are going through a tough time and the potential rises in the UK in our mental health concerns we're also seeing rises now in suicide, and even from our business in Bridge North, our service, we're seeing a rise in suicide, which is really alarming. Do you think we need, what, what can we do as a society to try and help with this? What do you think will, will help and make people to reconsider uh, carrying this out? I mean, it's incredibly complex. As my understanding, it was young men with the highest rates of suicide in the UK. But what I understand is that women now are increasing suicide because how they kill themselves is by shooting themselves, whereas before it used to be with overdoses, which sometimes failed. Um, so it's terrifying, the increase in suicide. Yeah. And, you know, the, the big message is that is knowing yourself and not being afraid of asking for help, yeah. of naming, I feel desperate, I feel really sad. But really what helps is doing it way before you get to that point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, early intervention is the key. And, you know, I mean, this may sound ridiculous, but the four things that are lifestyle choices that will automatically improve someone's capacity and mental health are exercise, nutrition, sleep, and connection. So when those things are, are not in place, people's relationship with themselves is distorted. They spiral and those neural networks become alienated in themselves the rest of the world kind of disappears. And what one way of describing a suicide is that, I, that it's like a heart attack of the brain. Yeah. And so that, you know, a young man can, and sad, sad sudden, uh, what is it called? Sudden death syndrome in adults as well as in babies um, can happen in the brain. And what I believe is that those four pillars go off and so that's how those neural networks in some ways blow up yeah and then those four pillars you mentioned you know i i have a belief that social media can be a big um stumbling block and disturbing that those four pillars all of them and i think also being judgmental and people painting a perfect life and i find it quite alarming is my personal opinion do you think it has a contributing factor, this world now, society or social media, or do you not think it's as serious as I think it is? I mean, I think what the research shows is that the jury is out because for some communities on social media, it gives them community and connection and information and a way of being themselves that is incredibly supportive. I think what's incredibly damaging is comparing yourself to others yes. and always you will end up wanting and also this performative aspect of you know however honest you're being on social media you are performing yep. and when you lose authentic connection with yourself that enables you to have authentic genuine connection with another person in person, yep. that changes your neurobiology. That changes how you feel, how stable you are, and how you operate in the world.
So the more isolated you get, the more you're kind of scrolling and doom scrolling and telling yourself very critical, awful messages. That then becomes a pathway in your mind yeah. that influences who you, who you are, how you feel and your outcome. So I think it does, it, it, when it goes wrong, I think it can be extremely damaging. We've looked at sort of how um, online um, has been used throughout COVID and how it was used in a very effective way. But I think the data suggests now that despite it being a good aid, there is a lack of depth behind it. And even sending a condolence via social media compared to writing a letter or picking up the phone. So even though the intent is still there, the actual depth behind the message is so much, so much more weak. Um, so I think that's a really important point to highlight really as well. I think, I do think that's right. I think what's important is that a letter you can keep and go back and read a million times over and having that box of, of letters can be an enormous source of comfort and, and solace to the whole family. Whereas, um, you know, a message on social media is ephemeral, it's kind of lost, you know, once it's been posted. I do think something like text, if you're really in significant loss and you don't have a lot of energy, having texts from people who are just checking in isn't of itself is supportive. Yeah. But you also need to know that if you are the friend who is the close friend, you do have to show up. You do have to bring the soup and the lasagna. Yeah. You do have to help take the dog for a walk or do the shopping. Be, or pres be present. Be present. Yes. And say, let me know what you need. You don't have to have an answer. You can't have an answer. You can't fix this. But being loving, warm, with a big listening ear, not so much talking. Yeah. You know, I think the big component of communication is listening. 70% yeah. listening, 30% talking. Be there and be there for the long term. So often people are there for the first three months, but then they get on with their lives. So if you are that, you know, if you're lucky, all of us have a kind of close network of six to eight friends. So like when someone dies, there are probably nine significant people who are affected. That team need to support each other um, and be in each other's lives and be in each other's lives. And sometimes that's not possible because they live in different countries or miles apart. But I do think hugs are neuro, again, neurobiologically, we are wired that something happens in our system when we're hugged yep. that calms us. When we're hugged, we can release and cry. You know, often people are kind of, they're white knuckling it and they see someone's face walking towards them and they start crying. It's because they can see the compassion in that, you know, people say... The, love, the love's there. It, 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 yeah. But people say it's the, what is it, the love that kills you. Yeah. You know, that's when you cry, but you cry because you can feel someone caring about you and seeing it in their eyes allows you to see it in yourself and that allows you to feel it. And as you feel it and you incrementally name it and the emotion is expressed, you do incrementally heal. Wow, that's uh, very powerful stuff. Wow. Um, you mentioned before as well, to going back slightly to the funeral service and the purpose of the funeral service uh, is about the physical letting go. Afterwards, you said about that person stays with you for your life. The rest of your life, yeah. yes. Um, and that love remains there. And I feel that with my own mum, who, who passed when I was 12, that she is still a part of my fuel and my fire. But so what advice would you give people to help them retain that love and that connection to that person afterwards in a healthy, positive way? What, what things can people do? So in my Eight Pillars of Strength in my book and actually in the GriefWorks app, I talk about touchstones to memory. You know, these are very personal. So it could be that you make your mum's favourite chicken pie once a month or every Sunday and as you're making it the smell the sight the sound the the taste of it you know because those senses are what bring people back they're very embodied they kind of bypass the thinking network and so that will be a way of keeping close to your mum 
someone may want to go for a walk where they always walked with the person that died or go for a walk somewhere else and talk about the person that died. It may be you wear something, a ring or a watch or a scarf or an earring or something hidden that nobody sees that you're wearing. It may be that you have a place in your house with a photograph that you always put some flowers in it and light a candle now and again. It may be that you write them postcards. So there are many different ways, but what is important is this continuing bond and that the conversation isn't over. So you said your mum gives you your fuel and your fire. So I'm sure internally you can say to your mum, should I marry this person? Should I buy this yep. thing? <laughs> mum, what do you think of these shoes? Um, mum, and she will answer you. So she, you'll have her internally and she will form part of your life and your decision making going forward. Yeah. I mean, the other add to that, to the kind of previous conversation, is it is an incredibly precious gift if people have written the people they love letters before they die. Yes. Because then they can go back and just remind themselves, she really loved me, he really loved me. Yeah. Um, and that's really what you it, want it to know. It was real. It was real. Because yeah, you can, memory is a, is a changing thing. We think we have this fixed memory but actually, memory, we know very well that memory completely changes over time. Yeah. And, you know, two people can be in a room and you, you can name the date and the room, but both of you talking about that experience yeah. will be very different. Yeah, it will alter. And it will be different if you come together five years later. It will be different again if you come together ten years later. What's interesting is that thinking about my mum now, I sometimes struggle to see her. Yeah. Um, so I was only quite young when she passed away. I knew I know what she looks like, but like the, the detail I struggle to remember. But what I what I feel is just the, the love. Yeah. And that's just always there. It's always present. So I'm very lucky. I'm very, very fortunate is how I see it. So um, no, thank you for your, for your words. But and also it, I imagine that her dying when you were young is what influenced you to do the job you're doing now? Well, it's it's definitely influenced me, it's helped me. It's a family business, so my father and my great, well, my grandfather, and my great grandfather oh, have all done it, so, um, but it's, it has put a, a, a different slant on things for me. And I don't really talk to people about my experience because, you know, it's, it's about them, it's not about me, but I think it gives me a, a heightened level of compassion and actually just trying to help them and just do what I can for them. Yeah. So um, it, I think it has helped me. You would have increased compassion. The, I, one of the things you said was that my mum passed away and I have a particular view on the term passed away or lost or yes. passed over or gone to a better place which is that it's a bit like protecting other people that we yes. we we, yes. we want to kind of not it, embarrass them to embarrass yeah. them and yeah. say my mum died yeah because she may have passed to a better place she certainly isn't lost yes and so i prefer the language of my mum died or yeah. when my mum died or but i guess for you with the families that you see, they would find that too yeah. brutal. I think you're right. I, I do it for other people to not make them feel uncomfortable, not to make them go, oh, that's a bit of a strong word. Yeah. So yeah, you are right. I do it for other people of myself. Yeah. I know she's, I know she's, she died. Yeah. I don't, I don't like to use the word dead either. No, I can see. <laughs> yeah. It makes me uncomfortable. Yes. So I think it's almost, it's, I don't know. It's, what is that? <laughs> what's going on? Well. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, died is softer almost than dead. Well, I think dead you see a body. Died, they died a while ago. I think dead you see it's the presence. image of a dead body. Okay. Okay, that's interesting. Wow. And that little piece of reality again means that you face that reality and that does support you. Wow, that's very interesting. I've learned, I've learned yeah, this morning. Yeah, there you go. Every yeah. day is school day, John. Yeah. And you mentioned as well about your app, which is my last point to come on to. So you, you've designed an app to support people. Um, is it possible, please, to talk us through how that works and, uh, and what it does, please? So I, um, from Griefworks, the book, 
I, I had more of a kind of position for people to trust me because they kind of felt that they knew me. And I really wanted to make the content of the book actionable so that people had something that they could use that could support them. And so with this other company, it's a 28 day course. So it's like, it's 28, 15 minute sessions that someone can do in their own time, talking about when the person died, facing the death, what is difficult. And so it, take, it gives them a structure that's very supportive. It also gives them like over 40 tools. So if they wake up at four in the morning with a pounding heart, it gives them a meditation, it gives them exercises, it gives them yoga. You're always there, effectively. I'm always there. Yeah. And, and it also gives them a journal. So we know from um, research that journaling your thoughts, like again, this thing of uh, finding a way of living with the loss, writing your feelings down helps release them as effectively as talking to a therapist. We now have another part of the app where they can actually contact a therapist. So in the app, which is £49, they have a whole suite that's completely accessible. It's 95% cheaper than any therapy. Most people can't get therapy. There's huge waiting lists, even in voluntary organisations like Cruise. Some people use it with their therapist. And I've been incredibly touched and slightly overwhelmed actually by how much people find it helpful yeah. and supporting them. And you know, I think it really does work. Yeah. So I'm very pleased. Oh well, well done. And uh, yeah, it's uh, people need support, don't they? It's it's out there, and um, hopefully we can put a link on this. This oh, that this would be amazing as well. So that would be amazing. Yeah, they're no, great. Well, um, that concludes our session, Julia, and just a huge. Can I have one? Uh, can I have a question for you? Oh yes, please do. You've turned it around. I've turned it around. Yeah. So how do you funeral directors support yourself given that it's quite a demanding job? That's a really interesting point. Um, I teach uh, diplomas in funeral directing and we cover a section on care and I state that care starts from within and you have to look after yourself to provide the best level of care to your clients. Um, but the answer to your question is, is it's limited. There's not much out there. We have um, a... You don't have the equivalent of supervision? No, we don't. We have a, we have a provider at the NEFD called Our Frontline, who is there to, to support um, the, the industry. But I don't, think a vast, I don't think many people at all take it up, or if any people take it up, really. Um, so is the culture, like, get on with it, forget and move on? I think so, yeah, I think so. I, I still have memories now of going to look after a young lady that threw herself off um, a cliff in Bridge North and the position she was in, you know, I had to, to sort it and look after her. And it's genuinely, I wanted to help her and protect her. So when her family, I'm, I'm thinking about her and her family about when they come and just making it as positive as possible for afterwards. Given how awful yeah. it was. And you're dealing with that and actually there's no, there's no conversation afterwards, which is quite alarming. Um, so I think you've, you, you might have hit, hit something here because I think we need to do, to do more within the industry. And I think what it highlights is the work that we carry out in the industry, which goes under the radar, which is almost there um, when people need us. And I don't think we value ourselves enough for what we do. I mean, one of the ways that you could think about is having monthly or six weekly debriefs in the team yeah. where they can be virtual, they can be in person, I prefer in person, yeah. um, where people talk about what had happened in the last month. They only need to take an hour, they could be at lunchtime or... And I think that thing of all of you kind of debriefing of, you know, I've had a good month, nothing terrible happened, or I had a really difficult case, mm. you know, this is really haunting me. And everybody kind of being honest about their experience, learning from each other. But really what you do is you normalize that some days are really difficult and you need support and other days they're not so difficult and you can then be the person who's supporting. Yeah. And having that culture 
to build your resilience by being honest and open about what your experience is just by a one hour session yeah. whenever or whatever the, the kind of interval is right for all of you I think makes a big big difference. Yeah I think that's a really good point and so that we can definitely uh, discuss and take forward so. Because otherwise I think uh, when I worked in the NHS and I did these debriefs I think otherwise everyone is looking at everyone else, assuming everyone else is okay yeah. and they're the only one that doesn't have the haunting image of a young girl. Yeah, yeah. Everyone in your team will have one image, at least, that haunts them. Yeah. And naming it, telling the story, expressing the emotion around it releases it so it doesn't stay so heightened in your body. Yeah. Well, um, Julia, just a, a huge, huge thank you. Um, I feel very honoured to be talking to you about this. I've learned so much stuff this morning as well. Uh, I'm sure the people watching and the members watching will, will find it very interesting and will learn further as well. And just again, a huge, huge thank you. It's been a real pleasure, John, and I really just hope it's helpful. So thank you for inviting certainly, me. Certainly is. Thank you so much.